We need the police. Everybody knows you need the police, but people want accountability to go along with that. It's hard to be told you're a racist, to be told, you know, quit your job, to be screamed at, to have stuff thrown at you. I agree that the accountability mechanism uh, isn't adequate. We gotta sit down and talk. We gotta sit down and talk. We gotta have them come in. Uh, I mean, instinctively, they, they may not be receptive to that or they might be fearful of that. But uh, that, that's the way we do it. That's how we solve all of humanity's issues, essentially. <laughs> we sit down and we talk about things. We're about to begin a difficult conversation about Portland and likely hundreds, if not thousands, of other communities across America. There seems to be an overwhelming call for police reform, but less certainty about how to get there. When you talk about policing in Portland, one word comes up repeatedly. Accountability. 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 It's the one thing everyone agrees is needed. So we're going to talk honestly about police, police reform, and the growing calls for accountability for police actions. This story will not tell you all police are bad. They're not. But it is a story about feeling misunderstood and unsupported. Black people and police, and where that leaves the community. The solutions for police accountability cannot be driven by fear. However, part of the reform conversations start that way. I think it give me a couple of those answers. We begin our journey through this difficult topic in Elijah Warren's kitchen in Southeast Portland. Oh, the history of Alcatraz. Warren and his 14-year-old son are working through schoolwork and distance learning. Well, you got this. Something parents across the country got comfortable with during the pandemic. We can do it. But navigating school during the pandemic is not what brought me to Warren's home in Portland. <laughs> Instead, it's an incident Warren says happened last fall. Following a long summer of frequently violent demonstrations, a group gathered at nearby Ventura Park last September. After a hundred straight nights of protest, standing off with agitators facing hostile and often physically violent crowds, Portland police officers may not have known what to expect when someone approached them. The night ended like dozens before it, officers and demonstrators clashing in this residential area. Eventually, officers used tear gas to break up the crowd. Warren says he walked outside when that gas came into his home to see what was going on. He spotted a group of officers nearby and walked up to them. I was just explaining to him that the tear gas was burning my son's eyes, his friend's eyes, the family dog, and myself, um, and that too much tear gas was being used because it, it was still coming into my house. I honestly only got a few words out like to actually engage to finish the conversation, and why that was happening, that's when I was hit. Did you ever see it coming? No, I didn't see it coming. Not at all. This picture shows the aftermath. Warren says it was an officer who hit him. He says other officers standing there shouted that Warren was a homeowner, not a protester. That officer, who Warren says hit him, is now under criminal investigation by the state's Department of Justice. It really made me just kind of hurt for my son because the protest was for that very issue. And... I did everything that they say you're supposed to do right. <laughs> and it still happens, so I feel like no matter what you do, whatever, whatever you're supposed to do right, even if you do it right being a black man, the outcome is still going to be the same. Those tears come from real pain, real fear. Warren now worries that for people like him, following the law and doing what's right isn't enough to stop some police officers from harming them. We need the police. We, everybody knows you need the police, but people want accountability to go along with that. We don't want the police to just be able to do whatever they want and then still be able to come back to a job and do it to somebody else. This is one of the main things people are protesting. The perception that officers are not held accountable. The laser focus on officer behavior has brought the Bureau under an intense microscope over the last year, and that scrutiny is taking a toll on the police bureau. Ken Dulio is an acting lieutenant in Portland's North Precinct. Do you think there are officers who feel like in this city their hands are tied from doing their job? Oh yeah, certainly police have pulled back somewhat. Why? Um, well, it's, it gets back to that. They don't feel supported. They don't feel safe doing this work. 
they feel like they can't do anything right. They're highly criticized for anything they do. He believes the scrutiny goes beyond what police should be subjected to and makes officers feel unappreciated. The morale is the worst it's been in my 23 years. I think most officers in the police bureau would leave this uh, job if they could. It's hard to be told you're a racist, to be told, you know, quit your job, to be screamed at, to have stuff thrown at you. You know, and that's what the officers experience, you know, all summer long. Dulio's perspective is one many officers share. However, Warren's story is why some people say not enough has been done to address complaints with police. Mayor, I want to show you a portion of an interview with a man who says he had an interaction with Portland police last September. I did everything that they say you're supposed to do right. And it still happens. I showed that clip to Mayor Ted Wheeler, who is also Portland's police commissioner. That happened last September. There are people who look at that incident, look at other specific videos from the protests last summer, and say officers still are not being held accountable. Well, I, I agree that the accountability mechanism uh, isn't adequate. I mean, that's part of the reason that we're taking a hard line on renegotiating our contract with the Portland Police Association. Uh, one of the, the things that's concerned me most is the current accountability system. In Portland, the investigation into officer complaints starts with internal affairs or the independent police review. Another board then reviews the case before finally making a discipline recommendation to the police chief and the mayor. That process is lengthy to say the least. It can be a year or two down the road before that case gets to me. That's frustrating for many people who say the current system in Portland doesn't support accountability. Chuck Lavelle is Portland's police chief. I think most people you'll talk to about our accountability or discipline would say it takes too long, and that's probably a fair assessment. You don't want to um, sacrifice accuracy for expedience, and I think you know it's important for us to, to really recognize due process. I think sometimes things happen and people are demanding some outcome or some process, but there is a process in place and usually um, you know there's a desire to rush through some process and you're uh, I think always better off going through the process making sure your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted. The process is largely outlined in a Department of Justice settlement agreement between the city of Portland and the federal government. It's been in place since 2014. It came after the DOJ accused the Bureau of using excessive force against people with mental illness. The DOJ has criticized the Bureau over the last year for approving uses of force. A recent Department of Justice compliance report says the police bureau prevents accountability in some cases. It says, quote, in general, there was a lack of analysis of officers force by supervisors. In this case, police pushed a journalist. The DOJ report says the bureau could not identify the officer nor show a completed report for the incident. Is that a concern among the command staff of PPV? I took concerns over incompleted reports to the police bureau. We can't get away from this, the sheer volume changing the um, speed with which we could report and evaluate. Lieutenant Greg Pashley says the nightly protests made it hard for officers to write reports nightly, but he insists they got done eventually. He also points to a low percentage of the times officers use force. I don't want you to think I'm implying that every single interaction ends in a use of force, but that does not justify an indiscriminate use of force if it does happen, especially during a protest event. Sure. And that's what the process of accountability is for in the complaint uh, intake process. Absolutely. And by the way, in Portland, every use of force complaint is investigated, which, which you won't find in police departments of very far and wide. Due to issues related to use of force last summer and how the Bureau tracked that force, the DOJ officially ruled the city of Portland out of compliance this year with the settlement agreement for the first time. Other people criticized the mayor and the chief for not calling out apparent officer misconduct when it arises. Mayor Wheeler says he can't comment on actions in this video. Officers are taking lawful action. Or this one. Stay on the sidewalk. Move back. Or this one. No! What? Before discipline is decided. Here's why. If I jump out and comment, for example, on a video that somebody sends me on YouTube and says, what do you think about Officer X engaged in this activity? If I came out and said, it's absolutely wrong, that officer will not be disciplined because I have just prejudged the case. People are entitled to their due process, and I honor that due process. 
Wheeler says the length of time is one reason he supports changing the oversight mechanism, giving citizens the ability to investigate and punish officers. That is arguably the biggest reform yet to come to public safety in Portland. In June, for the first time, a Multnomah County grand jury indicted an active Portland police officer for improper use of force on the job. This video we showed you earlier shows Officer Corey Budworth last August. He's now charged with assault for his actions while police cleared a crowd after declaring a riot. District Attorney Mike Schmidt with this message the day of the indictment. I think that this shows that today, uh, Nobody's above the law, that the law applies, uh, and when people break the law, that they will be held accountable. The same week, all 50 officers on the rapid response team who served with Budworth resigned. The team sent a letter to the city. A supervisor says the team, quote, feels there has been a significant lack of leadership. It goes on to say bureau leaders, quote, ignored the physical and mental toll the team has withstood. The officers said they could not accept the liability that came with the work. Officer Krut Arunsuk is not on the team, but says the issues prompting the resignation date back to last summer during the height of the nightly protests. It comes down to not being supported properly and appropriately by leadership, not having clear direction to do the job that they were tasked to do. And yet they did it well. However, some city leaders say the resignation show that officers don't support accountability for their own actions. Several street officers and the police union deny that. The police chief addressed the mass resignation days after it happened. I think it's important to remember too, we're, we're talking about people, individuals who had a, a really um, a really traumatic summer in, in some cases. And I think that it's important to, you know, when we think about RT, realize that uh, they worked very hard and uh, did a lot of great work this summer, uh, work that I'm proud of. And, and um, I think to, to me, it's important to recognize just the human factor behind the people that do that work. Officers say morale was also impacted by the other big topic of discussion, and that's police funding, specifically how much the Bureau should get. Going into the fiscal year, starting in June of 2020, Portland Police requested just over $248 million in its budget. However, the mayor cut $12 million from the budget due to the pandemic. Then the cuts deepened. In the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's death last summer, the council cut an additional $15 million. It also eliminated several specialty units. That meant over $27 million in cuts, or about 10% of what PPB originally asked for. This is an action with a title. It's called defunding police. Here's why it's come to Portland. Commissioner Joanne Hardesty long criticized certain specialty police units for targeting black people. Hardesty pointed to an audit that showed how many black drivers officers were stopping in gun violence work. Charlie Ashheim was on that unit. There were some that said that proved the unit was racist. How do you respond to that? I, I would say uh, that that's absolutely not true, and it's offensive. It's offensive to be accused of being a racist. You know, you can look at numbers and how many people you stopped and ratio compared to races, but that isn't what was happening. We, we were not out stopping people based on their skin color. We were out stopping pay, people based off criminal intelligence, trying to catch them with guns, trying to catch them related to shooting crimes and prevent the next shooting. The weeks and months that followed disbanding the gun violence reduction team proved to be some of the most violent in the city's history. We spoke to Elmer Yarbrough in the midst of the surge in violence last winter. His nephew was killed in Southeast Portland last summer. He called on city leaders to put the gun violence reduction team back together. How do you respond to people who say that the decision to disband that unit was because the officers targeted black men? I think the officers targeted gang members. They just happened to be black. And if you look at our streets, the people who are actually doing the most shootings, sadly enough, are, are, are young black men. And they save lives. And since they've been disbanded, um, that's all going to hell. Yarbrough's statement is backed up in the most recent shooting arrest data we found in Portland. 
the nonprofit California Partnerships for Safe Communities compiled shooting arrest data from police organizations from 2015 to 2019. It shows Portland police arrested 49 people in that span. Of those, 65% were black, 29% white, and 6% were Hispanic. Once again, these percentages are of only 49 people charged despite hundreds of shootings in Portland in that span. It does not represent shooters who are not caught. The police bureau and others in the city blamed budget and unit cuts for the increase in shootings in Portland. However, Commissioner Hardesty pointed out increases in violence nationwide. Cities like Chicago, New York, Atlanta, and other large cities in the U.S. saw an increase as well. The city's 2021-2022 budget, approved in June, finally provides funding for the bureau to hire 30 officers. At the direction of the mayor and council, those hires will simply replace others who leave this year and next. By the fall, the bureau must eliminate all of its vacant positions. That is super disheartening to police officers. It's just, for officers, it feels like it's one thing after another and it just doesn't stop. Every time you go, man, things might be starting to turn, there's a little more support, then something else happens. Some people closer to the violence say cutting police funding and resources did not help the problem. Royal Harris has been working in gang outreach for much of his adult life in Portland. I would say that quite often a reaction has a lot more emotion than logic to just slash money because of things we don't like or historical problems without looking at how the, the actual necessity of certain units isn't wise. I think also we have to look at there are injustices around race, around police excessive force, but we also have to look at the fact that we still need an effective police force to manage the needs of a city of close to 700,000 people and that's going to require manpower and also a better approach and a more, more efficient approach to doing that. Do you think the city has that now? No. to just slash money because of things we don't like or historical problems without looking at how the, the actual necessity of certain units isn't wise. We still need an effective police force to manage the needs of a city of close to 700,000 people and that's going to require manpower and also a better approach and a more, more efficient approach to doing that. Do you think the city has that now? No. A K2 News investigation shows officers have been leaving the bureau since last summer over 100 to be exact. Lieutenant Ken Dulio estimates even more will leave over the next year. We have officers that have 10, 20 years to go and they're going out the door. What does that say to you? You know, it, it, it's sad, it's disheartening. Uh, these are some excellent men and women that are leaving. And, uh, you know, and also the Portland Police Bureau has, you know, put a lot of time and energy and training, you know, into these officers. The numbers show Portland is already among the leanest police departments in the country. Right now, the Bureau says it has just over 800 sworn members. That comes out to about 1.2 officers per 1,000 residents. The national average is about twice that, 2.4 officers per 1,000 residents, according to the FBI. It doesn't make sense to officers, you know, how the public leaders would allow the police bureau to slip to the point that it has. So is Portland's police force size the critical issue for keeping the city safe? You might be wondering how Portland's roughly 810 sworn members compare to other cities with a similar population. Here's a small comparison. Oklahoma City and El Paso have roughly 1,100 officers. Nashville has about 1,400. Memphis, nearly 2,000. However, when you look at crime rates, it's a different story. Portland and El Paso have a lower violent crime rate by population than the other three cities, according to the FBI's most recent crime data from 2019. Portland's size of 145 square miles is also by far the smallest of the five cities, despite similar populations. In the current climate, communities are looking for that kind of information. Experts like James McCabe say even this doesn't tell you enough about whether a police force size is appropriate. 
McCabe is a former inspector for the New York Police Department. He now works for the Center for Public Safety Management, an organization that does law enforcement staffing studies across the country. When you strictly look at the number of officers in a city, does that tell you enough? No, it doesn't. Why not? Well, um, in order to determine um, the number of officers a community needs, you need uh, empirical data uh, based around calls for service, crime, um, cases uh, investigated, things of that nature. So it's not as simple as saying, you know, the number of people in a community equals X number of officers in that community. In the absence of some of that data, what might be some signs that you're not properly staffed? You might look at response times to calls for service. So if responses, uh, the, the time increases, um, you might look at uh, crime, if crime increases. Um, you might look at complaints from the community uh, about not seeing police officers and the lack of visibility. In Portland, response times peaked last summer during the height of protest and the first round of retirements within the police bureau. In February of 2021, the chief moved several officers from specialty units back to patrol. Response times have come back down since then. Matt Page, 5507 Adam. Matt still, the commissioner in charge of the 911 center says police are still not hitting their goal for response times. And there's not a way to fix that unless we have either, either less crime or more police officers. Commissioner Mingus Maps says city investments in crime prevention and alternative first responder programs may decrease the need for police. Still, he believes the bureau likely needs to add officers. Mayor Ted Wheeler agrees, saying this at a recent event while discussing the turmoil in the police bureau. We have a scaled down police bureau. I have long said that our staffing on the streets is inadequate. Ultimately, it will take at least three council votes to add resources to the bureau, which has only hired 16 officers in the last year. That includes 10 people hired last week. Commissioner Joanne Hardesty is by far the loudest critic of the police bureau in city government. She's strongly opposed budget and resource additions to the Bureau since last summer. Many believe the first-term city commissioner who's long pushed police reform is anti-police. She said this late last year. I hear all the time that I'm anti-police. I'm not anti-police, I'm just anti-bad police. I am not an abolitionist. I know there are many people who just want to abolish the police totally. Police have a role in our community, but unfortunately it's been oversized. Just who are those bad police Hardesty talks about? How many are there? We tried to find out, but that is hard in Oregon. State law shields a lot of that information from the public. In Portland, over the last 10 years, the city's independent police review, internal affairs, and officer supervisors have investigated over 3,500 misconduct allegations, most brought by the public. Roughly 20% of those claims are sustained, meaning the officers were guilty of misconduct. The other 80% either lacked evidence, the claims were found to be untrue, or ended with an exoneration. The internal overseers have not released how many officers drew the complaints, nor will the city tell us who those officers are due to the police union contract and state law. For much of the last year, Hardesty and the police union have been locked in an indirect argument about whether the Bureau needs more resources or not. Consistently, the voices that show up during city council public hearings are calling for more defunding. Here's a sample from a hearing recently on the mayor's proposed budget. We do not need funding going towards the police who at their core murder, harm, and traumatize members of communities they are not even part of. And I am here to demand that the city council defund 35 million from the police and redirect it into the community. Start by cutting the police budget and prioritizing black and brown lives. This discussion is polarizing. City council meetings are flush with people voicing the complaints you just heard. In neighborhoods, you find the views are more varied. Maybe some who are scared to voice their support for police, but who fear that more cuts will make them less safe. Randy Philbrick lives in the Hazelwood neighborhood. They've seen about 100 shootings since the beginning of 2020, the highest in Portland. He wants to see more officers. We need to get that accountability. I believe that we need to get that accountability, but I do believe that there are a lot of good cops out there. David Potts lives in the nearby Lentz neighborhood. That's where the city launched the Portland Street response. It replaces an armed police response to some mental health calls with social workers and mental health professionals. Potts worries more budget cuts will make his neighborhood and others less safe. In some, you do not support budget cuts to the police bureau? I do not. Uh, that's the simplest way, and I'm, I'm a lifelong liberal, and I, 
I can't believe that I'm aligning with the <laughs> with conservative Republicans on that matter, but I do because I I would like Portland to be a safe place to live. And I don't believe it is right now. This is where views diverge. Many white people view police as a sense of security. Many others, including a lot of black men, don't view police through the same lens. It's hard for white people to determine that everything that they're comfortable with and they love is the problem for the black people they say they care about. Your privilege is a byproduct of me being need on and stepped on and mistreated. The reason you're comfortable with the police force is because I think by proxy I'm not. I met with Terrence Hayes and a group of black men to discuss the issue. Hayes says simple reform won't fix policing in his eyes. What I'm talking about is looking at the system and reforming it in a way that doesn't um, make me fear the moment I get pulled over. And I think you have to do that at a found foundational level. I think you have to look at all the bad information, all the bad um, seeds, as they say, and then you have to uproot the totalities totally. So when people talk about abolition, I don't think this is simply about no accountability in our community is saying that this, this system um, has to go away. In a 2019 citywide survey, white Portlanders were more likely than black Portlanders to say the city should invest more money in the police bureau. Black respondents ranked economic development ahead of police services. Given the racial makeup of the city and the, the differences in how each race sees police, how do you balance that when you have a white population that does want more police, broadly speaking, and you have a black population that feels like they've not been heard for so many decades here. The, the treatment of black people at the hands of police in this nation absolutely needs to change. It is not equitable. And everybody in our community should feel safe. So in terms of balancing those interests, I think people want the same thing. I think they want a police bureau where we hire good, decent people who have the community's interests at heart. They expect those individuals to be well-trained. They expect them to be accountable to the public that they serve. And so if we can really focus on those priorities and on those values, I think we'll satisfy both the needs in communities of color as well as the majority white community. Getting to a common ground is proving to be difficult. Ultimately, Royal Harris says the main focus should be on providing equitable police services to everyone, regardless of race. He sums up his thoughts on the defund the police movement like this. I think it's a slogan. I think for many different people, it means many different things. If there's not that much depth and breadth into what we're talking about, we're really providing a slogan, which is like giving a kid a sugar rush when we should be providing a balanced meal. Most of the discussion around police reform focuses on improving interactions between officers and black communities. For many black men, the fear shows up on something as basic as a traffic stop. When you look up and see blue lights, what goes through your mind? Is this going to be the last time that, you know, I'm here on earth? I mean, I'm nervous even if I know that I'm not doing anything wrong. It's like you got to suck into this, this space as to where it's just like at the end of the day, you're just thinking, I just want to go home. Am I going to get killed? Am I going to get shot? Knowing I didn't do anything wrong, I got license, I got registration, um, insurance, the whole nine. Those are feelings police have to understand and be willing to embrace and not take personally. Policing is an ever-changing profession. Officer Kurt Arunsuk knows this. He's been on the Portland Police Force about two years. He believes giving people individualized, positive experiences with law enforcement one by one can make a difference even on something like a traffic stop. I'm not usually always barking orders, essentially. Uh, I go up there, uh, I'll talk to him. I'll, I'll talk to him just like a, a friend on the street, essentially. Ultimately, I mean, this is about restoring trust, trust between the police and the community and community and the police. In your opinion, how do you go about that? How do you go about restoring the trust? Again, this goes back to my, my ground rule of we got to go out there into the community as officers, as uh, representatives, and speak with them, uh, invite them to come in, and let them see what 
policing really is like, why we do the things we do. Uh, I think the better informed the public is, the, the better we all are, essentially. Arunsik says ultimately, training and real-world experience is the best way for officers to get comfortable and confident in their jobs. Portland's police chief, Chuck Lavelle, says he tells officers to do all they can to ease fears of people they're interacting with. Some of that involves training. Some involves how you talk to people. However, too many black men feel like they're policed a certain way because of how they look. If you ask 99% of black men what, they, what the police officer pulled them over for, they're going to tell them they failed this signal within 100 feet of the turning corner. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're going to tell you that. And so they pull you over or they're going to tell you a tail light out. You get out your car, your tail light working, your, your blinker working, everything's fine, right? But they pull you over, they run your name, they ask you this, they ask you that. Now for me, that's, that's highly agitating. Black men tell me they feel like they're treated as a threat to officers more frequently. They feel like officers are scared more around them than, say, someone like me. What do you make of that? You know, that perception, uh, I've always taken that to heart. Um, you know, the work that I did when I was part of the gang enforcement team and then the gun violence reduction team after that, um, you know, we would go out of our way to show respect for people, be open and transparent about the reason we're stopping people, uh, the reason we're out here doing the work we're doing. We would try to build trust and build relationships because that belief, even though I might say, hey, that's, that's not reality, you don't need to be afraid for your life when I pull you in a traffic stop. But if they believe that, then we, as law enforcement, you know, professionals need to do everything we can to overcome that. We need to break down those barriers, break down that fear, build that trust. In Portland, the data shows black men are more likely to be searched during a traffic stop than white people. In 2019, police searched about 6% of black drivers during traffic stops, compared to almost 4% of white drivers. Police say the numbers don't tell the whole story. The police bureau's equity manager pushed the chief to get rid of consent searches and end traffic stops for non-moving violations like a busted taillight. I think there's some things we could try and see if they have an impact on uh, safety and maybe even some of the, the data as far as uh, uh, disproportionality. But, um, you know, I think for us it's really about making sure that the things that we're doing are thoughtful and um, they're going to serve the community in the long run. Just this past June, the police bureau made some major changes. Chief Lavelle directed his officers to focus on traffic stops for things like speeding and driving under the influence, not those non-moving violations. He also directed officers to make an audio recording of themselves getting consent for a search and telling drivers they can say no. Ultimately, Lavelle says there is work to do to restore trust between black people and police in Portland and beyond. He wants to move back towards community policing to improve the number of positive interactions between officers and people in the community. People do remember when they have interactions with the police, and I think it's important for us to remember that too. And, you know, we might be getting a lot of guns off the street or a lot of, you know, contraband, but at the same time, we're, we're having these interactions, and you have to ask yourself, what is the impact on the person who's been stopped, you know, multiple times, searched multiple times, and maybe sometimes they have something on them, maybe sometimes they don't, but over time, they're gonna develop you know, some type of feelings towards the police. Some men in this group are less optimistic that true reform can come in the current system. Reform looks different to them. What it looks like is, is a community that has the ability to make decisions about people within its own community. The black community isn't afforded that. And until we can, until the men that are going to work in our community is allowed the opportunity to influence what the police can and can't do in our communities, then we'll be in the same place. What's happening in Portland with police reform is a microcosm of what's happening at the state level. In a political world defined by partisanship, Democratic State Representative Janelle Bynum and Republican State Representative Ron Noble pushed a bipartisan package of bills this year in Salem. Noble is a former police chief set on improving a profession 
he gave so many years of service to. The conversation is welcome and the door's been open. We're going to step through it um, because we could do better. Nationwide, there is a concern with how police officers who commit misconduct are or are not held accountable. How do these bills change that in Oregon? So I think what we're looking at is building a foundation or, ch or changing the foundation that things are currently built on and building a system of legislation that um, incorporates trust, accountability, community input, um, good labor practices. All of those things I think are foundational to what we're trying to achieve. And I think the grievance and, and these bills for me are a way to address the grievances of the people who have marched. It seems like brown people, black people, are the ones who bear the brunt of the mistakes. And that's not okay. Go deal with those guys. The changes focus on improving how cities and counties hire and train law enforcement officers. There are also measures to strengthen the ability of agency leaders to punish officers who commit misconduct. Noble says his law enforcement experience makes him believe these are things that need to change. I can train people how to be a cop. I cannot train them how to be trustworthy. I can't train character. I can't train um, just a work ethic. I can train them how to do the job if they have those other things. And then I have to be able to hold people accountable when they make a mistake. So are you saying that the way the laws and policies are now, it's not easy for you to get rid of somebody who you look at and say, that person maybe shouldn't be an officer. Absolutely, because sometimes they can be a good officer and then maybe wear and tear, traumatic, uh, vicarious trauma, they're no longer suitable for the job. Right now, it's difficult to get rid of an officer. Noble wants to make it easier to discipline and dismiss officers. Labor lawyers are fighting the change, saying it will open the floodgates to politically motivated terminations. One bill that just passed in the 2021 session speeds up investigations into officer misconduct. And remember what I said earlier about how officer complaints and discipline records are private in Oregon? Representative Bynum pushed to make all complaint records public. The effort failed. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. I am a, a transparency believer. Um, and it also allows us to be human, right? So unless we hold ourselves to a higher standard and know that our transgressions in some cases may be public, um, it doesn't really give us a chance to reflect and it doesn't really give us a chance to be held fully accountable. Both lawmakers acknowledge this is the start of a long process. Their hope in time is to create a system safer for the community and those who serve and protect them, a system free from fear. State Senator Lou Frederick is one person who's been advocating for these changes for a long time. We have seen a, a great deal more. I mean, we've seen the discussion about re, uh, training, about re-understanding -under uh, a different way of looking at public safety, and not law enforcement, but public safety. What would be your message to a police officer about your efforts for police reform? Any police officer who's, who somehow believes that uh, I'm attacking them, I'm not. What I am saying is don't tell me about the bad apples if you're not stopping the bad apples. At Elijah Warren's home, he says conversations about police, fear, and how to interact with officers have been frequent in the last few months with his son. The younger Warren is scared of police after what happened to his dad. I just looked out as good people, and what happened to my dad was messed up because he ain't even do nothing. During my conversation with Jalen, he broke down. You okay? Mm -hmm. Fine, you're doing a good job. Moments later, he's back shooting hoops in the street. Elijah is back sweeping his garage, talking about the real fear within his home and his community. It's almost like Vegas, a crapshoot. You don't know who's pulling you over. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, it's like you might get a good one, you might get a bad one, but that type of stress and fear is real that you, don't, you may not know how a traffic stop could just end up in something totally going south. Warren's fear is real, and the perception about a lack of safety around police is common. How do we go about changing those perceptions within the black community when it comes to police? We gotta sit down and talk. We gotta sit down and talk. We gotta have them come in. Uh, I mean, instinctively, they, they may not be receptive to that, or they might be fearful of that. But uh, that, that's the way we do it. That's how we solve all of 
humanity's issues, essentially. <laughs> we sit down and we talk about things. So what are the next steps? Most agreed, at least starts with a conversation. This is a tough topic with no easy answer, but hopefully this gives you a different perspective. If one thing is clear, finding a common ground will take everyone. Let's keep the conversation going.